Today's video is brought to you by Carrie Black, author of Sometimes Illness Wins, A Guide to Understanding and Living with Grief. Hello, and welcome to my channel. Vice Rhino here. Today, I'm doing something different. I'm going to respond to an email that I got from someone named Terry, with the subject line, Do Atheists Enjoy Lying? I'm going to go ahead and throw the text of the email up on screen so that you can read along. I copied it directly from the email, so just blanket sick for the whole thing. Uh, but I also had an AI read it out, so there are a few spots where the vocal inflections are a bit weird. Sorry for that, but it's better than what I used to do when responding to text, where I'd read it out myself and then apply effects to my reading voice. This one is probably going to be a bit on the shorter side, but given that my last two videos were hour-long monstrosities, I feel like that's okay. I mean, if you really need more of me in your life, I release clips from my live streams four days a week on my streaming channel, The Watering Hole, so that's an option for you if this one's too short for your taste. And as long as I'm talking about my other stuff, you can also listen to my videos as a podcast by going to podcast.viceroundo.com, and channel members get early access to videos. I'm not sure if YouTube gives it to members ad-free, but patrons also get early access, and I know that their stuff is ad-free, so that's an option as well. Anyway, let's go! But first, a word from our sponsor. When author Carrie Black faced the passing of her daughter, well-meaning people tried so hard to help by giving her books on grieving, but nothing she found was just right. So she wrote a book that she wished existed, Sometimes Illness Wins. It's an illustrated book for all ages about navigating the loss of someone special. Written with the distraught brain in mind, it's an entry-level distillation of available information about the grieving process, what to expect, and what can help. Everyone in my house got a copy of it when Mrs. Rhino passed away, so everyone could make their own notes in it, write their own thoughts and feelings, but reading it together was also a bonding experience. I love that it strongly reinforces the fact that everybody grieves differently, and that that is okay. Because one of the hardest parts of grieving is feeling like your thoughts or emotions are inappropriate to the situation. Reading it together with my kids was really helpful in making sure that they felt safe and loved while expressing themselves in their own unique ways. Everyone grieves differently, so the book approaches grief from a general perspective, but it includes sections where you can fill in details that are specific to your situation. If you or someone you love is going through the grieving process, this book is the perfect accompaniment to well wishes and a thoughtful listener. Sometimes Illness Wins is available for less than the price of a bouquet of flowers. Many readers have found it worthwhile to have extra copies on hand to share with friends and family as the need arises. Grief often comes without warning. Sometimes Illness Wins is grounded in secular, evidence-based best practice, and it's both for adults and children. It's written without appeal to religion or superstition. It turns out that once in a while, the book that the world needs would never make the bestseller list, so here it is filling in the gaps. Whether you're going through the grieving process yourself, or you want to be prepared to help others in their time of need, please click on the link in the description to order your copy or copies today. I'm sorry about the title being a bit harsh, but it's unfortunately not too far from the truth though because something I've noticed before is atheists are almost always wrong. So starting off with a sorry not sorry message. This actually was a pretty good way for Terry to set the tone of the email, as the whole thing is written as kind of a condescending I'm right you're wrong and nothing will ever convince me otherwise screed. Probably 90 plus percent of their statements, claims are either twisted, out of context, straight up lies, a hypocritical stance, or an atheist using an excuse that's completely, completely irrelevant from the question, concern in order to feel like they can ignore the concern when in reality they have yet to give a valid answer. Well, I can't speak for all atheists, but when I'm working, I go out of my way to provide full context. I avoid even the appearance of lying to an extent where I often end up ruining my own jokes because if a part of the joke was me saying something not true, I feel the need to go back and explain why that untrue thing is untrue rather than just leave it hanging and assuming that 100% of people who see it will realize that it is untrue. Now, I'm sure I've had hypocritical stances on things from time to time, though I try to avoid it. I am only human after all. And yeah, I do frequently go on irrelevant tangents, but that's not as part of an excuse to allow me to ignore a concern. It's usually because I get bored giving the same answers to the same objections, and that's how I keep my own interest. I wouldn't be able to do this week after week if I didn't get to tickle my ADHD tendency to go off on rabbit trails that result from my hyperfocus. The logic used by atheists is unfortunately so bad that someone can arrive at the conclusion that the Earth must be flat by simply using the exact same excuses atheists 
used while deflecting religious claims. Uh, by saying, show me evidence that the earth is a sphere? Because I don't believe the earth is a sphere based on faith. I believe that based on overwhelming evidence. For example, show me evidence the earth must be a sphere. And it can't be from NASA or astronomers, since they are obviously biased and claims don't count as evidence either. So, while this was sent directly to me, I can't help but wonder if this isn't a generic email that this person sends to any atheist content creator they run across after making slight modifications to make it look more specific. Because I very rarely, if ever, resort to the trope line of prove the god of the Bible without using the Bible. Quite the contrary, I actually have a whole ass video where I use the Bible to disprove the God of the Bible. If the God of the Bible actually existed, I would expect to find evidence of that inside the Bible. Since the Bible makes claims about the properties of God, we can see if our observations about reality match up with the claims that the Bible makes. We can also check to see if the claims about God are consistent throughout the Bible, with inconsistency being evidence against God's existence. And Spoilers, our observations about reality do not match up with what would be expected if the God of the Bible existed, and the properties of God are not consistent throughout the Bible, with God sometimes having properties that directly contradict some of his other supposed properties. Although, come to think of it, this could be you defending a disbelief in evolution on the grounds that the Bible doesn't allow for it, in which case the Bible is actually irrelevant to the discussion. When making claims about reality, you can verify those claims independently. So if you say evolution isn't true because the Bible doesn't allow it, we can study biology to see whether or not that is a true statement. And if you are correct in both your assessment of the Bible's position on the topic and in the claim that the Bible is inerrant, then a study of biology will agree with the Bible even if we don't start with the Bible. The fact that so many apologists refuse to set the Bible aside when studying reality in order to see whether or not the Bible actually lines up with reality speaks volumes. And those volumes aren't good for creationists. Because here's the thing, astronomers and NASA don't have a dogmatic book that they must adhere to at all costs. Astronomers aren't even one cohesive group. Independent astronomers working for different organizations and governments at different times with the use of different technologies and with widely diverse religious views have all come to the same conclusion. The Earth is an oblate spheroid. And as I pointed out in my video responding to a Flat Earth documentary, much of the evidence is stuff that you can see for yourself by learning a bit and performing some very easy experiments for yourself. No holy book required. You would never say that because you realize you'd sound like a massive idiot. Yet you use those claims against religious people, though. No, I don't. You can use your holy book when trying to prove your God, just as I use it to disprove your God. Though, come to think of it, just using the passages in the Bible that say God exists isn't really doing that. I'm talking more about looking at the properties of God as laid out by the Bible and then comparing that to what we observe in reality. But if you want evidence of the spherical Earth that comes from outside of NASA and astronomers, ask a pilot sometime, or a meteorologist, or any number of a different crew positions on a ship. All of these are jobs that would be very different on a flat Earth. When that's the case, perhaps you should rethink your entire stance. Counterpoint, if you find yourself unable to accept scientific data that is easily verifiable unless it agrees with your interpretation of your holy book, then perhaps you should rethink yours. Some of your recent videos are decent examples of what I'm referring to as well. You recently uploaded a video claiming the Bible condones of slavery. But that's simply not true, though. And nowhere in that video did I say that Christianity isn't true because you can't prove God without the Bible. The Bible is so anti-slavery that slave traders actually made a modified version of the Bible that supported slavery. But they had to rip out 20,000 plus verses in order to do so. That's referring to the Slave Bible, the Bible that I've usually just routinely dismissed by saying that, worst case scenario here, is that this shows that the Bible sends contradictory messages about slavery, because it definitely explicitly condones slavery in several places. You know, I'm not going to get into that now. As Terry said, I have a video on it from a few weeks ago, so if you want to watch that, I'll leave a card. But even if I grant this point, all it says is that if you ignore the Bible verses that explicitly condone slavery, you could take an anti-slavery message out of the Bible. But in looking into it now, I've learned that the very existence of the Slave Bible is largely a lie. 
There are only three that have survived to modernity, and the one that's usually referenced is the one that's held in the Museum of the Bible, with the story they tell of it being the one that's largely reported on when outlets like NPR bother to touch on it at all. But as soon as I learned that the main source for this interpretation of the slave Bible was the Museum of the Bible, I became quite a bit more skeptical. The Museum of the Bible has been caught not only lying about their exhibits, but just straight up displaying fakes and forgeries. And when they did have real items, they were often sourced from the black market, with them lying on their customs paperwork in order to get them into the country, resulting in them being fined and having to return several artifacts to their home countries. So upon doing some deeper digging, I found out that what has been dubbed the Slave Bible was not actually put together by slave traders to make slaves more docile. It was originally suggested by the leading abolitionist in the Church of England in the late 1700s and early 1800s, Belby Porteus. An abolitionist. A guy who was vehemently against slavery was the guy who proposed the book that came to be known as the Slave Bible. And you would expect a Bible designed to make slaves accept their lot in life to include verses like Leviticus 25, 44 through 46, which tells Israelites where they can buy slaves to keep as permanent slaves. But it excluded those verses. It also excluded several New Testament passages demanding that slaves obey their masters. And it even includes several verses where God tells the Israelites to remember that he's the one who freed them from the bondage of slavery, making it clear that being in the bondage of slavery is a bad thing. Again, you'd think that if the purpose of this book was to make slaves accept their position as slaves, you wouldn't want to draw attention to the fact that one of the ways God constantly refers to himself is as the guy who freed the Hebrews from slavery. So no. The Slave Bible was not meant to be seen as a complete Bible, with them sneakily hiding the anti-slavery verses from the slaves so that they wouldn't get any ideas, as the Museum of the Bible would have us believe. They actually perform a nice little character assassination of Bishop Porteus in order to get us there. They quote him as having said, "...prepare a short form of public prayers for them, together with select portions of scripture, particularly those which relate to the duties of slaves towards their masters." Notice the two ellipses in that quote. Turns out, they did that thing that Terry just accused atheists of doing, where they removed some very important context in order to put their own spin on it. The full quote is, "...prepare a short form of public prayers for them, consisting of a number of the best collects of the liturgy, the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, together with select portions of scripture, taken principally from the Psalms and Proverbs, the Gospels, and the plainest and most practical parts of the epistles, particularly those which relate to the duties of slaves towards their masters." This was Bishop Bishop Porteus asking the clergy in the British West Indies to put together material that they could use for church services specifically geared towards slaves. And in order to appease the slave owners who would object to any form of education of their slaves, he had it lean towards the message of slaves performing their duties to their masters. His goal with this was to convert and educate slaves, with the idea being that when they were freed, they wouldn't be at as much of a disadvantage as they would be if they were completely uneducated. The slave Bible was never meant to be perceived as pretending to be a whole complete Bible. It was a partial reprinting of the Bible that had verses selected for their relevance to someone in a specific situation. Much like the Soldier's Pocket Bible, which is a heavily abridged Bible from 1643 that mostly contained verses about how soldiers should behave in war. Which I really hope came from the generic be good verses rather than actual verses dealing with the rules of war like those found in Deuteronomy 20. The Museum of the Bible didn't display the Soldier's Pocket Bible and then complain about how many verses were cut out of it in order to make soldiers feel better about being soldiers. They praised it for making the Bible accessible to soldiers who wouldn't be able to carry around a full-size Bible. And while I don't think the Slave Bible was good by any stretch of the imagination, the fact that the Museum of the Bible felt the need to lie about it and pretend like it wasn't originally proposed by an abolitionist in order to demonize it really speaks volumes about how hard it really is to make the Bible seem anti-slavery. You can claim the Bible condones of slavery as much as you like to, but when slave traders themselves ironically agree with me and say the Bible doesn't actually condone of slavery, then perhaps it's time for you to stop spreading misinformation. Or perhaps you could look into it a bit deeper than you did and realize that it was an abolitionist, not slave traders, who called for the creation of what you are calling the Slave Bible, and that it was most definitely not meant to be what the Museum of the Bible says it was. You uploaded a video about a month ago saying that people shouldn't think the Earth is young. You're gonna have to be a bit more specific than that, buddy. That's most of my channel. But you don't seem to realize it's yet another hypocritical stance that you have because how are you able to ignore radiometric dating results is inaccurate, but creationists can't, though. I don't ignore inaccurate radiometric dating results. The only thing I can even think that this could be referring to are things like when xenolithic inclusions are dated from young volcanic eruptions. They come back with ages that are older than the eruption. 
that doesn't get ignored at all. Creationists do like to ignore key bits of it though, like the fact that the words xenolith and inclusion are usually in the titles of the papers that are doing this dating, indicating that they aren't dating the material that melted in the eruption itself, but are dating the older rock that didn't melt in the eruption, and as such is not derived from the magma of the eruption, but had an older origin, and so would date older. For example, Horton Bluff tracks are a set of 350 million year old ostrich footprints. The Horton Bluff tracks are tetrapod tracks of an organism that had five toes. Most of them, some of them had four. Ostriches are the only species of bird that only had two toes instead of three or more, so this really couldn't be ostriches. The idea that they are ostrich tracks came from Ian Juby, who came to that conclusion after personally studying the tracks himself. I compared those footprints to actual ostrich tracks at an ostrich ranch in Alberta, and they are a dead ringer. Except he has zero qualifications when it comes to identifying fossilized footprints, and actual paleontologists have concluded that the creatures who made those tracks were quadrupeds, not birds. We've found diamonds that were radiometrically dated to six billion years old before. I had never heard of these six billion year old diamonds before, but after looking into it, turns out that the researchers who originally dated them to six billion years suspected that there was an unusual form of contamination at play right from the get-go. And after some new research into the geochemical origin of cubic diamonds and the discovery of a correlation between chlorine content and argon-40, it was determined that the excess argon-40 was included in the diamonds during their formation. Argon-40 is the stable isotope of argon that is used in potassium argon dating, generally when forming there would be no discrimination between the inclusion of different isotopes of the same element, but in this case it was determined that excess argon-40 was included in the diamond, which, if not accounted for when doing your dating calculations, would result in radiometric ages that appear significantly older than it should be. And Skull 1470 is a 230 million year old human skull. Skull 1470, more properly known as KNMER 1470, is a 1.9 million year old Homo rudolfensis skull and I see no indication that it was ever dated to 230 million years. Before it was properly dated, it was estimated to be somewhere around 3 million years old, but that's the oldest date estimate that I can find for it. That's just the tip of the iceberg as well. Well, next time maybe put your best tip forward, because those were all really bad examples that were super easy to figure out. Because not only are there millions of out-of-place fossils that are redated to fit within the theory of evolution, I've seen numerous creationists claim this, but very rarely have I ever seen any examples provided. And in the rare instances when examples are provided, it's always innocuous stuff like the fact that KNMER 1470 was estimated to be about 3 million years old, and then once the proper dating calculations were performed, it was determined to be about 1.9 million years old. That's not redating it to make it fit evolution, that's giving an estimate before the calculation can be performed, followed by, you know, performing the calculation. If I look at a jar of jelly beans and guess that there's 5,723 beans in there, and then someone later counts the beans and finds there to be 4,498 beans, that's not changing the data to fit our preferred conclusion, that's an estimate followed by an actual calculation. And thousands of locations worldwide where the fossil layers are in the wrong sequence. This is another claim that I've heard regularly but have never actually seen backed up by anything. But something that is rarely discussed is the fact you must completely ignore the entire field of geology, as well in order to assume the tree of life is factual. Nope. You've actually got it exactly backwards there, Terry. Pick any random geologist, and they'll actually tell you that you have to ignore the entire field of geology in order to believe that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and that there was a global flood just 4,000 years ago. You can even include the creationist geologists in the group from which we are pulling our random geologist, because chances are, of the 15,000 or so geologists working in the United States alone, your random pick will yield a real geologist rather than one of the four or five creationist geologists that are out there. For example, we've found gigantic pieces of oceanic crust floating around in the hot molten core of the Earth before. Which means the entire Earth vastly reshaped itself not too long ago because if it happened slowly, or millions of years ago then it would have melted away by now. But it obviously hasn't though. No, you're not even getting the creationist version of that claim right. The cold slabs are in the mantle, not the core. And when we say cold here, we need to keep in mind that this is relative. The slabs of oceanic crust are cold compared to the rock around it, which hovers around 1400 degrees Celsius. But it's not like surface rock temperatures. These subducted slabs are around 1000 degrees Celsius. Also worth mentioning is that neither the mantle nor the slabs are molten. 
They are solid rock, but at those temperatures they are quite a bit less viscous than what we normally think of as solid rock, which allows for the movement of some bodies of rock through others. That's actually how we wind up with the bent rock layers that creationists love to harp on about. They bend when they're in the mantle, being subjected to intense pressure and temperature. And on top of all that, one of the ways that we calculate the ages of these subducted slabs is to calculate how long it would take them to heat up to where they are. So their current temperature is literally a part of the measurement of their age, which confirms that they are tens of millions of years old. Diamonds also prove the Earth must be young because they need to be formed down towards the molten core of the Earth, and then rapidly be pushed up towards the surface to cool down. In other words, we wouldn't have diamonds on Earth if the fossil record actually took hundreds of millions of years to form. I'm not even sure how he thinks this proves a young Earth. Diamonds form in the mantle at a depth of about 150 kilometers, in what's called the Diamond Stability Zone. After they form, they just kind of hang out there. They don't need to be brought up to the surface rapidly in order to cool. The way they get to the surface, though, is through a rare type of volcanic eruption, a deep source eruption. Bits of rock containing diamonds get ripped apart by the rising magma and are carried to the surface to become diamond-bearing xenoliths. It is largely unknown how long it actually takes diamonds to form in the mantle, though jewelers would have you believe it takes billions of years in order to justify their otherwise ludicrously high prices, but the actual formation of the diamond doesn't necessarily take that long. It's just that most of the diamonds near the surface were formed about three billion years ago, so that's an easy talking point. So ultimately, diamond formation doesn't prove or or disprove anything about the age of the Earth or evolution, though the ages of the diamond definitely proves young Earth creationism wrong. Another example of atheists being wrong would be how atheists twist separation of church and state out of context. An incredibly easy way to form it is by simply pointing out how if atheists' interpretation of that Jefferson's personal letter was true. Then how are atheists able to get a judge to accept the atheist's case if the government can't represent anyone's religious beliefs? Okay, couple things here. Firstly, I don't hold to originalism when it comes to interpreting American legal shit. That's just never made any sense to me. Like, a good chunk of the writings of the Founding Fathers are them disagreeing over what the stuff in the Constitution means. So to argue that X is what the Founding Fathers meant in the Constitution, as though they were some monolithic group, just seems silly. Second, the context of Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptists, which is where we get the phrase wall of separation of church and state from, was with reference to government officials proclaiming religious feasts, something that he opposed not because he personally was not religious, but because he saw it as something that England did, with their monarch, the head of state, also being the head of their official church, and they didn't just fight a war to get out from under England's boot, only to set up the same system in their own country. He stated that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, as a way of reassuring the Baptists that he was not about to make policy decisions that would infringe on their right to believe and practice their religion as they saw fit, but neither would he make policy decisions that would endorse one religion over another. As to a judge accepting an atheist case, I'm assuming that you're talking about one of the instances where a group like the Freedom From Religion Foundation sues a school district or something for promoting religion, rather than just a judge being willing to preside over any case where an atheist is involved. Because if we go go back to the context of Jefferson's letter, the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. The FFRF sues when government employees take actions that violate the religious liberties of others, like a school teacher presiding over a prayer at the beginning of a class in public school. Anyone who does not share that teacher's specific religion is having their right to religious liberty violated. And this is easy to show as well. Would you be comfortable with your kids attending a public school and then finding out that their teacher was a Muslim who made the kids kneel on prayer mats five times a day, face Mecca, and pray Muslim prayers? Probably not. But that is directly comparable to what a Christian teacher who makes the kids pray Christian prayers is doing. And for the record, I also don't support the idea of an atheist teacher getting up in front of the class and proclaiming that God is dead, Kevin Sorbo style. I would like to bypass senseless debate altogether and jump to the conclusion, which every sophomore is already aware of, there is no God. All that I require from each of you is that you fill in the papers I've just given you with three little words, God is dead. That would also be a violation of the student's religious liberty, at least in a public school. And this is what it all comes down to. It doesn't matter to me what Thomas Jefferson or Alexander Hamilton or any of the other Founding Fathers thought the First Amendment meant. What matters is a question of the interpretation that would be applied most equitably, and the Wall of Separation interpretation accomplishes that. As an atheist, I can agree that I don't want kids in public schools indoctrinated into any religious beliefs, and that includes being told not to believe in any religion. 
I would think that Christians wouldn't want atheists teaching their students that God isn't real, or Muslims teaching their students that Islam is the one true religion, and so should be able to understand why Muslims, atheists, or parents of any other religion wouldn't want Christian teachers doing the same thing. So when it comes to government operations, the government should not work under the assumption that one religion is true and others are false. It should operate separated from religion, which includes judging cases in which the separation is violated. It's incredibly obvious that atheists are wrong about that law. I mean, once again, you've demonstrated that you don't care about context in the email where you accuse me of taking stuff out of context. So go ahead and believe that if you like, but you're wrong. This message is getting kind of long. So I'll wrap it up with my final point. Please actually look into a subject before making a video about it because not only are you often wrong, but it can have unintended consequences as well. Well, that's rich coming from a guy who's been dead wrong on every single point he's brought up so far. Do yourself a favor and read through the sources in my description sometime. I don't just make shit up when writing my scripts. I go to great lengths to make sure that I am correct. And on the occasions when I have been wrong about something, I have issued corrections and apologies, either in the form of pinned comments or mentioning it at the beginning of the next video. I don't want to be an atheist regardless of what is true. I want to believe true things. And so far, from the information about the universe that I've been able to gather, I see no reason to believe in a god. Like how you sometimes claim that there's nothing wrong with gay couples. Even though science has confirmed before that child of same-sex couples will end up living a life that's 15% shorter because the lack of another sex while growing up directly impacts their genes. See, now you're just flat out lying. Either that or you severely misunderstood the study that you linked here. Like, really, really, really severely. That study looked at children who lost a father, either through divorce, incarceration, or death. Children who lost a father had telomeres that were, on average, 14% shorter than those who had not, with significant variation depending on how they lost their father. Paternal death averaged 16% shorter telomeres, incarceration was 10% shorter, and separation or divorce was 6% shorter. Now, you may be wondering what this has to do with the children of gay couples. Fuck all, that's what. Like, using a similar degree of misunderstanding of this study, it would be easy for me to say, since losing fathers shortens the telomeres, having two fathers would lengthen them. And I would be just as wrong. Actually, I'd be slightly less wrong, because I didn't say they'd live longer. Telomere length is related to cellular health, and it is true that your telomeres shorten as you age, and shorter telomeres are associated with developing things like cancer. So I would expect that kids with shorter telomeres would, on average, have shorter lifespans. But this is not a direct relationship, and there are other mitigating factors. Telomeres, for those who don't know, are segments of DNA in your chromosomes that are essentially buffer zones. Every time a cell splits, some of the DNA gets damaged or lost, so the telomeres are non-functional DNA that exists in the spots on the chromosomes that are most likely to be damaged during cell division. Now, notably, to bring it back to the study, it's the stress that a child is under when going through the loss of their fathers that is thought to be the cause of this shortening. You know, because losing your dad is a stressful thing. But a baby being in a loving home with LGBTQ parents is not in an inherently stressful situation. In fact, the only stress that could have an impact on this that is directly related to whether or not they are LGBTQ is minority stress, something that is caused by people in society having a negative view of their inherent characteristics. In other words, if there is a negative effect due to stress on a child growing up with LGBTQ parents, it's the stress that is directly caused by assholes like you thinking that there's something wrong with them. But that aside, what does actual research that is relevant to same-sex parents have to say on the matter? Well, when it comes to behavioral issues and overall mental health, there is no difference between children raised by same-sex or heterosexual couples. When it comes to school performance, the children of same-sex couples did slightly better than those of heterosexual couples. So when we actually look at the research, at worst, there is no difference in outcomes between the children of same-sex couples as compared to children of heterosexual couples. But the kids of same-sex parents do probably do a little bit better in school. So to rephrase what you said to me, please actually look into a subject before sending an email about it, because not only are you always wrong, but it can have unintended consequences as well, like how you contribute to the minority stress that LGBTQ people experience. That's it for this one, and thank fuck for that because my voice is about to give out. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Impala359, who says, I see you have the Lego Apollo rocket. I have one as well. What was the hardest part of building it? Well, Impala, that would be rebuilding it after it had been dropped.
much easier to build it from scratch than to try and figure out what spots you need to jump to in the instructions to figure out how to fix it. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager. Thanks to TZ Krasner and Aaron for sending me Christmas presents to my P.O. Box. Sorry it took me so long to remember to check it. TZ sent me a copy of his book, Sword of Lions, which seems to be written as a continuation of the Arthurian legend. I haven't read it yet, but it's next on my list. And Aaron sent me some lovely crystal scotch tumblers. Don't forget to go to fillingthegappublishing.com to order your copy of Sometimes Illness Wins. And special thanks as always to my patrons, it's me to do, and all the rest, who are the priceless artifacts on display in the biblical museum that is my channel. If you'd like to turn out to be completely fake, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is where you'll also find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. I promise I'll remember to check it at some point. See you next time! Ha <laughs> ha